It's it's great to see you, Carl, and uh, we are we are very happy that we will be uh, telling you what what we have been up to so far. Where are you, Natalia? I'm at home at Oxford. We 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 can enter the lab, but not not but not so much the offices. We are discouraged to use our offices. So so we are working mainly at home, and then when we go to the lab. And uh, there are restricted numbers, so we kind of book slots and we go to the lab in, in, in some particular times. But yeah, we are, we are, I, I was just saying to Marius that, uh, that we are managing to do a lot uh, remotely, really. Uh, well, you, you, you have a lab to, it, it's easier if you're a theoretician to it, work at home. <laughs> yeah, so we are allowed in the lab, but not in not more than two at a time. So that that complicates a bit things. But uh, we we are managing, and we are using lots of um, the tools that we have been developing in in artificial intelligence to to control our devices remotely. So yeah. it's okay. It's okay. We are we are managing, but uh, of course it's not it's not the same. Um, and we can spend less hours in the lab. But okay. That's fantastic. By the way, can I be heard? No. I, yes, yes, it's, I, I think well, I can hear you, Ismaili. It's Lee. Yes. Yes, okay, good. Ciao, everybody. That's I heroic if you, you keep a, if you keep experiments going in these conditions. So, sorry? It's heroic if you keep experiments going in these conditions. It, it is, <laughs> it is hard. It, it, I must say, it is quite hard. But uh, it's, uh, you know, oh, I was desperate. The second they say, "Well, we can enter in twos," so I say, "Yeah, I'll take anything." You know, <laughs> we just uh, because, um, yeah, we just need, especially we need these large pieces of equipment at uh, twenty millikelvin, so the dilution refrigerators. And um, they required a lot of maintenance. So once I managed to get them up and running again, I was uh, I was very happy. And we can start slowly uh, the experiments. Um, so yeah, we've done all we could to to kind of go back quickly. So actually, the lab closed in the twenty fifth of March. I remember because I had to go and switch off every piece of equipment, and that was quite sad. Uh, but then we were back by mid-July. So, uh, well, how that, that... How many of you are working on the, on the actual experiment? How many are you? Well, now we can't be more than two at a time. No, but um, all together, how many people is, is, is working on the, on the experiment? I mean, not, not, I don't mean at the same time, all together. Well, so, so my group has two, two parts. Um, one, uh, so part of my group is, is working on, on, um, on developing uh, machine learning techniques to basically control our devices optimally. And the other part of, the, of my group is working in, in the quantum thermodynamics in using um, nanoscale resonators and nanoscale devices to try and understand um, thermodynamics really at the nanoscale and uh, and also these these experiments that Anna has started would be would be continuing um, hopefully soon. And the part of quantum thermodynamics, there are um, now three postdocs working on this and one graduate student. Uh, but we would be this, this group would be growing quickly. The thing is with COVID, all the recruitment has been a bit free, frozen. But um, so all, these people, all these people go to the lab and put their hands on the same on the same experiments. Is that right? Well, um, yes, yes. I mean, in, in this case, uh, because we have, um, well, we have a, typically the running of the fridge and the analysis and these experiments are very long. So Anna would tell you, but Anna has Spent, I don't know, Anna, what was it? Two, three months together <laughs> all the um, data or more? Two, 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 three months to get the data, but I mean, to get a working device was like over a year. Um, yeah. I so mean, there are this whole project's been years long to just get where we are now. 
So some people do the fabrication of the devices for some period of time, and some people are looking at the fridge, but there is not many people looking at the fridge at the same time, typically. It's two or three that are working there, or, or even one. But, um, but yeah, the, there is a, uh, um, because experiments are so long, um, typically we try to coordinate that when somebody is measuring, somebody else is fabricating, or somebody else is analyzing data. So we try to kind of coordinate it like that. Yeah, not so long. My friends working in gravitational waves took 30 years to do one, one experiment. Oh, <laughs> so you see, we can't complain, Anna. We no. <laughs> yes. I, think, I think that's somehow the point. Yes, yeah. No, and, and I mean, this experiment that Anna has been trying um, to, to establish, it's a very challenging one. And uh, of course, it, it, it requires a lot of... Um, yeah, a, a, a lot of uh, work and we're always getting a bit closer, but of course this, this takes some time to, to develop and- Yes, uh, a work in progress. A work in progress. So yeah, Anna has, uh, you know, has a lot of, done all, a lot of the kind of um, base work and, and put this in a, in a very strong position now uh, to, to continue. I just have uh, to say quick, can I say a quick hello to Carlo? Hi, Andrew. Great to see you. Great to see you. What, what, what Anna hasn't told you is that there was a time when there was a noise signal coming into the experiment because these things are fantastically sensitive to any mechanical vibration. And we tried everything to discover what the origin of the noise might be. Aliens. And <laughs> almost certainly, Carlo, almost certainly. Or it could have been animals uh, digging up the ground from Australia. Uh, it could have been anything. Anyway, at, at one point it went away. So Anna dived into the lab, quickly got all the data she needed for fear that this <laughs> identified noise might come back again. <laughs> well, so you still haven't not identified it? No, nope. <laughs> we still don't know what caused it. All that went away. Yeah. Yeah, Nana was uh, had a pile. You you should show that that picture, Anna. This pile of uh, uh, high frequency equipment. That oh, uh, I ha I've just got the diagram, not the photo, but it, it's not in the slides. <laughs> I've got it at the end. But uh, I think I, I had several hundreds of thousands of pounds of electronics just to measure one signal. Yes, Anna. I, I was, so Jen, uh, I'm a theoretician. I always dreamed to be in a laboratory. I never succeeded to do anything. I just can't do anything concrete. So I envy you that with your hands. <laughs> but Anna, Anna had a, her main ambition in her PhD to, to, was to use uh, more expensive bits of equipment and more of them than anybody else in the lab for any other mm -hmm. experiment. And I think she got the gold medal for that. I, think I that. won. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, hi, Andrew. Um, hi, else. Great to have you, and um, oh, I wouldn't miss it for anything. <laughs> um, yes, I'm very excited to have um, um, all of you here. Thank you for uh, accepting the invitation again. And uh, okay, let's continue with the presentation and then we will have plenty of time um, to chat. So um, we have Anna Pearson today from the Oxford uh, Materials Department uh, that we talk about testing gravitational decoherence through the heating of a mechanical resonator. This is an experiment that she worked on in her PhD. Um, uh, her supervisor was, is, uh, was Natalia Ares that is with us today. And the lab is um, uh, the lab run by Andrew Briggs, which is also here with us today. So, Anna, please. Thank you. So, um, yeah, thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak here. So, as has already been said, I'm going to talk about testing gravitational decoherence through the heating of a mechanical resonator. Um, and here you can see a picture of, of the device, or one of the devices, which I'll talk about in more detail later. But to start with, 
I'll give you a brief outline of where this talk's going to go over the next 30 minutes or so. So first I'll try to put this work in some context, so discuss some other gravitational experiments that have been either proposed or carried out. Then I'll discuss the theory of classical channel gravity, which is the theory we're trying to test, and its predicted effect. Then I'll talk briefly about cavity optomechanics, which is the field which the experiment falls under, or the branch of physics which the experiment falls under. And then I'll introduce the experimental setup and some preliminary results, but as we've been discussing, this is a work in progress, and then conclude with thinking about some future work. So, when thinking about foundational gravitational experiments, a question that one might start with is whether or not a massive object can exist in a superposition or not. And so here is one way one might go about trying to create a superposition of a tiny mirror. So this setup consists of two cavities in um, each arm of an interferometer. And in one of the cavities, the one end is free to move and has a tiny mirror on it. And for this to be able to be in a superposition, we need to engineer a very strong coupling between the photons in the interferometer and in the cavities and the motion of the mirror. And with a strong enough single photon coupling, the motion of one photon can displace the mirror from its um, unperturbed state to its perturbed state. And so if you have a superposition of the photon being on arm A and arm B of the interferometer, you also get a superposition of the mirror being displaced and not displaced. While this idea is really beautifully simple, the experimental requirements are really very, very stringent. An alternative question we could think about is um, what is the smallest mass that can act as a gravitational source for an experiment? So this diagram outlines an experiment which makes use of time-dependent gravitational fields to sensitively measure the gravitational constant of a small, and by small we're talking about a milligram scale source masses paving the way for applications such as improved precision measurement of Newton's constant and experiments where a quantum system can itself act as a gravitational source mass. Returning to the question of macroscopic superpositions, we can try to push the boundaries of the mass scales involved, but we can also think about the boundaries of the separation of the superposition and the time scale that it is um, held for. Now this experiment, which has been carried out, it's not just a proposal, achieved a 54 centimetre separation of a mass of approximately 90 atomic mass units for a time scale of one second. So while this is um, a slightly smaller mass than the, the largest masses that have been superposed, this experiment really pushed the boundaries of the uh, separation of the superposition and the time scale that it was held for. Matter wave interferometers it has also been proposed, can be used to witness gravitational entanglement if the gravitational field should prove to be quantum. And this idea is that two objects cannot be entangled without a quantum mediator. And if you have two adjacent matter wave interferometers, the phase evolution introduced by the gravitational interaction of true micron-sized test masses can entangle them. And this entanglement can be certified through spin correlation measurements. It has also been proposed that one interferometer could be used to measure a phase shift between the up and down spin components of a microsphere, which is predicted to be an effect of the object's self-gravity calculated from the Schrodinger-Newton equation. I'm oh, sorry, wrong way. Um, but if we move away from superpositions and entanglement, uh, can we find out anything without those quantum features? And the answer is yes. An experimental signature of collapse theories, such as continuous spontaneous localization, is a change in the equilibrium temperature of a mechanical oscillator. And this is due to a violation of the equipartition theorem due to wave function collapse. Now this excess energy can be as expressed as a temperature increase, which in the case of CSL depends on the geometry of the system. So uh, Venanti et al used a 100 micrometer cantilever with a ferromagnetic microsphere attached to the end to enable detection with a squid superconducting quantum interference device. And they actually measured um, the measurements of the thermal fluctuations of the cantilever revealed a non-thermal force noise of unknown origin. And this was compatible with the CSL heating predicted by Adler, although not with the more conservative estimates by Girardi et al. 
Improving upon this experiment a few years later, we introduced this structure here, which consists of 47 layers of uh, mater two materials of contrasting density. Uh, I think it was tungsten trioxide and silicon dioxide, for those of you who want the details. And this um, increases the heating predicted by CSL. And with this experiment, they were able to improve on their previous bound by one order of magnitude and uh, started to challenge the CSL bounds proposed by Adler. And then finally, just to give a very brief overview, um, it has been proposed that ion trap techniques with levitated nanoparticles may be a way to detect the heating predicted by collapse theories. Now this may have the advantage that it may be possible to achieve lower temperatures and dissipation rates than in other settings. But let's have a think about classical channel gravity. So questions about the border of the quantum realm have vexed physicists and philosophers for about the past hundred years. And one of these questions is the role of the observer. The observer is supposed to act outside the unitary evolution of quantum systems and have an external influence on results. But we don't want to add to the Sorry, the, the sound is not very good. It's just for me that I, I hear your voice with a certain difficulty. Is that for everybody or is it me? I hear very well. Oh, you hear? I hear her very well, yes. Yeah. OK, so it's me. Sorry, apologies. I no problem. I, I'd much rather you said than um, So if it's OK, I'll, I'll carry on. So um, the problem is we don't want to anthropomorphize the theory, making the old mistake of assuming that we lie at the center of the universe, or in this case, that humans are at the center of the theory. So a way around this could be to include gravity. Could gravitational interactions act as an observer? Caffrey, Taylor, and Milburn have proposed in this reference here that gravitational interactions could act as classical measurement channels, developing proposals by DRC and Penrose. As one cannot shield from gravity, any massive object exhibits open measurement channels through its effect on space time geometry, and this distinguishes gravity from all other forces. The key thing is that the measurement channels are a source of decoherence even if the results of the measurements are never known, that is measured by a measuring apparatus. And thus we can think of gravitational interactions as having the same effect as an observer. A point to note is that any system environment coupling in the born Markov approximation can be thought of as an observer. However, the idea in this paper is to consider the coupling as a measurement in order to get around quantizing gravity. So, in KTM, through Taylor and Milburn's model, gravitational interactions are realized as measurement of speed forward channels. That is, the classical Newtonian potential is the physical channel through which information about a measurement on object A is sent to object B, and vice versa. And a classical measurement channel is one that cannot be used to entangle systems. So here we have a picture of how things might be if gravity were to be quantum and it can entangle two masses. However, in classical channel gravity, the Newtonian potential measures the position of each mass and gravity is acting as an observer and this prevents the masses from becoming entangled. The measurements of position carried out by the Newtonian potential cause a corresponding back action force on the momentum of each mass. And so the two predicted effects from this theory uh, decoherence in the position basis and a density dependent heating rate. This is because when decoherence is present in position, it applies to fusion or heating and momentum. And as I mentioned before, heating effect is a common signature of collapse theories. So the experiment that was proposed in the paper uh, makes use of two mechanical resonators. Um, and they reduce the model to the case of two quadratically coupled harmonic oscillators. They find that the gravitational decoherence rate for position in natural units is one half of the gravitational heating rate, and also that these parameters are of the order of the normal mode splitting between the two mechanical resonators due to their gravitational coupling. So 
The normal modes consist of the center of mass mode and the breathing mode of the oscillators. And the ability to prepare the ground state of the two normal modes through purely gravitational interactions is a test of gravitational decoherence, because such a state is a superposition state of the local modes. Now, to get to the experimental part, an experiment capable of resolving the normal mode splitting, or the lack of it, is extremely challenging. Even in the best case scenario, using depleted uranium spheres with a frequency of one hertz, the splitting is predicted to only be of the order of 10 to the minus 7 hertz. So we had, I think, and in collaboration with Jared Milburn, Kieran Kostler, as, as you mentioned at the start, Natalia Ayres, Andrew Briggs, and Edward Laird, we found that trying to distinguish the normal mode splitting is not the only way to put this model to the test. Uh, we realized we could use uh, one composite test mass in place of two masses placed close together. So instead of looking for the normal mode splitting, we could look at the temperature increase. And one test mass is sufficient because inside the composite test mass, we can consider the individual masses of the atoms. And the spacing between the atoms is far closer than we could achieve experimentally between several objects. Although, of course, the trade-off is that the masses are far lighter. So in our case, the composite test mass is the silicon nitride membrane. So in this model, each atom within our object interacts with the background Newtonian potential as depicted. And in the classical channel description, each atom is effectively measured exactly once in a time step PT. And the measurement outcomes modify the global Newtonian potential. And this potential acts on all the other atoms. Due to these measurements, as mentioned before, the atoms undergo decoherence in the position basis, which leads to momentum, diffusion, or heating. Kieran Kostler did the calculation for the heating rate. Is that a question? Yes, Does, is this making a very generous assumption as to the decoupling of the different degrees of freedom? That is, does this assume Gaussian independent fluctuations for the positions of the different atoms? Um, I, I, so I didn't do this calculation. I'm not, I might need to um, defer that question. Um, maybe we'll discuss it at the end. Um, and so, yeah, Kieran Kostler did this calculation. And um, an important note is that the heating rate is calculated assuming a minimum value for the classical channel measurement rate. So this prediction is the minimum allowable heating rate predicted by the theory. And it's also derived assuming we're measuring the fundamental mode of a crystal of density mu. And S here is a dimensionless constant, which is of ordered unity for a crystal structure. And so for silicon nitride membrane, which is what we use, we obtain that the heating rate is approximately 1.2 times 10 to the minus 41 watts. Although this is very small, it is the minimum bound and the actual heating rate could be larger than this. And it's also worth mentioning that this equation combines H bar and G in one equation. Now, some of you may be thinking, what about this paper that says gravity is not a pairwise local channel, which in this paper, they use um, data from atom interference experiments and lead to the conclusion that gravity is not a pairwise local channel. However, the key point is that pairwise interactions lead to a significantly larger decoherence rate. And this work is based not on pairwise interactions, but on the assumption of a global background potential, which leads to a much smaller decoherence rate. And this is not founded by the data from atom interference experiments. So, Let's have a little think about cavity optimal mechanics. Just in case some of you aren't familiar with the field, I'll discuss it briefly. So cavity optimal mechanics deals with the interaction of electromagnetic radiation and mechanical motion. And it's easiest to visualize in the optical regime, but the same holds for the microwave regime. And so if we take the Fabry promote model, we have a cavity, two mirrors, and the uh, Photons enter the cavity, and the resonance frequency of the cavity depends on its length. Now, if one of these mirrors is free to move, 
as it moves, it changes the length of the cavity and therefore its resonance frequency. And so photons which enter the cavity carry information about the position of the mechanical resonator when they leave the cavity. In addition to the movement of the mechanical resonator affecting the photons, we also have the fact that the photons, which carry momentum, can affect the motion of the mechanical resonator. This is known as radiation pressure. And a key parameter is the single photon coupling strength, which is defined as the change in the cavity resonance frequency per unit displacement times the zero point motion of the oscillator. And this is the basic Hamiltonian, which has the charm of photons in the cavity, the phonons in the resonator, and interaction time between the two. Now, we are not dealing with optics, we're dealing with uh, microwaves and radio frequency waves. But the theory is the same. The only difference is that instead of a mirror that is free to move, we have one plate of a capacitor. And the resonance frequency of our cavities is one over the square root of the inductance of the capacitance. And as one plate of a capacitor is free to move, it changes the capacitance of the circuit, which changes its resonance frequency, which is as an optical. And cavity optomechanics can be used to perform thermometry. So if you drive a cavity at a central frequency, so labeled FC, what you will get is uh, two peaks, which are called sidebands, and they correspond to the motion of the membrane, and they're set for whichever resonator, but we use a membrane. And they're separated by the mechanical frequency from your drive term. And the area of these peaks is proportional to the mode temperature of your resonator. And so here are two pictures of our samples. So we work in two different regimes, in the radio frequency cavity, which we have here, and the microwave cavity, which we have here. And both have their advantages and disadvantages. So this cavity, um, which is made of lumped elements, so for example, that there is an inductor and the capacitors are tiny, so you can't see them. Uh, this is the membrane purchased from Mercada. Uh, it's stuck on with epoxy, which I do by hand. This is a chrome gold antenna, and these are the bonds to bond the chip to the tank circuit. Uh, this cavity has a large bandwidth, which is good for um, task readout of the motion. And also, we can inject noise into this cavity, which is useful for detection of the resonances. This cavity has a much higher quality factor, which is good for sensitive measurements. Um, and so each has their uses. So we start off with um, the radio frequency cavity, which can be seen in more detail here. So what we have is a circuit, which is the cavity, the membrane, which is our mechanical resonator, capacitive coupling as the membrane moves, and we can drive the cavity through this port we can directly drive the membrane. So the cavity is in the megahertz regime and the membrane is in the kilohertz regime. So we need two different drives and we can apply a DC voltage as well. And using this setup, we can characterize the circuit and find the mechanical resonances, which is the first step towards testing gravitational decoherence. So if we sweep a probe frequency, we uh, get a dip and this corresponds to the resonance of the cavity. If we fit this, we get a quality factor of around 7.4, corresponding to a line width of say 28 megahertz. The next step is to find the resonance of the membrane, which is slightly more involved. So we drive the cavity at its central frequency, which is shown by this red triangle. And then through the second port, we apply a lower frequency term in the kilohertz regime. So what you can see here, uh, the blue trace is at a frequency below the mechanical resonance. The green trace is at a frequency above the mechanical resonance. And the orange trace is when we hit the mechanical resonance. And you can see that our signal is vastly amplified from the vibrations of the membrane. It's easier to visualize in a 2D plot. So here is one of the sidebands as we sweep the kilohertz frequency tone from 27 to about 210 kilohertz. And you can see this diagonal line here, and you see these star-like features. And these obey to, within less than a percent, the expected spacing of the modes of the square drive. Uh, Anna, I don't think the slide has changed. 
Kesson oh. Fee. Um, so that's the previous one, and now on the next one. Is it changing for other people? Mm. No, it's not. No. Has it it's changed? It's uh, 18 now. I am seeing that. So you should see something that looks like a Christmas card. No, Anna, it's not. It's no. 518 for some reason. Hmm. I will. Shall I stop the share and start again? See yes, that? let's try that. Try to okay. start uh, again stop, sharing. Stop the share. Sorry about this. And share again. Share. Now? Taking its time. It's taking its time to update. So it says that you've started screen sharing, but it hasn't yet shown any slides for me at least. Okay, I'm going to try again. No, it didn't seem to work. Let's try again. Okay, now can you see? It says it says double click to enter full screen mode. Yeah, so but in the it's not in full screen, but can you see a slide which looks like a Christmas card? No, no, that's the trouble, Anna. Is I know the slide that you're expecting, and it's not there. In fact, it's just black at the moment. Um, Let me just do screen, and then, so this, okay, now. It says I'm screen sharing. Um, it's still black. Oh, that is a, a, quite annoying. Um, um, yeah, Anna, maybe, I mean, it's not your fault, there's some issue with Zoom. Um, maybe you can uh, log out of the meeting and log in again. Yeah, I'll try that. Um, so it's still black. Yes. Wait, so sorry about that, Anna. Okay, I will log out and log straight back in. Uh, no sorry about this. Maybe in the meantime, I, I can take the question about the uh, distance between, um, well, the, 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 the strength of the measurement. So this is following the CWR um, model. So it, it, it decays at, as uh, one over D to the six. So um, I, I don't know if that, if that answers the question partially at least. You can think that it's very much like a non-retarded Van der Waals. Exactly. Here we are. Uh, oh, well done, Anna. Success. Ha! Huh. Yes. So this was the Christmas tree, I think. Uh, now uh, I see. The Christmas card. So you've got the, the stars. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so we have a joke that we should make a loud Christmas card. So this, what you're seeing, is a one sideband from the, the tone that we insert. And you see these resonances here, which correspond to the spacing of the modes of the square drum. So we know that we found the resonances we're looking for. So we now know at what frequency the membrane vibrates. We can do this um, by injecting noise into the system as well. And uh, this is like creating a heat bath. And it, uh, increases the amplitude of the vibration of the membrane's motion. And you can then fit these peaks with the Lorentzians, extract the single photon coupling strengths and the quality factors. Um, we also did optomechanically induced transparency measurements, but all those details are in this reference here for anyone who is interested. There's a very small aside, um, an interesting journey we had along the way when we did the gravity experiment was as we developed this system, we found that actually we could use it as a thermomechanical clock. This is because we can inject noise as a heat bath. And because of the large bandwidth, we can see these oscillations of the membrane in real time. And if you count one oscillation as a tick, you have a thermomechanical clock. And what we found is that the theoretical prediction that uh, clock's accuracy should increase with its entropy production, uh, we found that that helped during this system, in the classical system, even though it had first been predicted on the quantum system. And those details can be found here for anyone who's interested. But anyway, going back to gravity. So for this experiment, we work in a low temperature lab, as Natalia mentioned in the beginning. 
And so this is what um, Andrew's lab, and this is um, some of the dilution refrigerators in the lab. So when they're closed and operating, they just look like gray canisters. Um, but when you open them, they look a lot more interesting, and you can see the different. Uh, we can't see the dilution lab. I think the slide is stuck again. Um, every, is that the same for everybody? Yes. Oh no, <laughs> it's such a nice picture. Um, so maybe you could try, you're sharing the entire screen, right? What did you try to share the specific uh, program? Yeah, that's what I was doing at the very beginning. Um, is, is this close to the end? Do you, is it too, too well, I have, I, I need to show the, the results from the gravity experiment. I mean, I, I can Absolutely. just, no, 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 we, no. I can talk through it. Is, are you seeing it now? No. Uh, if you want to, I can another, just explain. Another thing you can do is if, if you drop me the slides, I can, I can share them. And, yeah, and maybe that right. works. Yeah, shall I do that? Oh, they are in our, they are in our folder, so I must have them, right? Well, let me just update it. Um, because I, well, these slides are the same. I edited the beginning ones. Let me just um, save it in our, in our Dropbox and then you can just download it straight away. Um, wait a minute. I'm, I'm not sharing at the moment, am I? No. Yeah. Okay. Um, Yeah, so given the technical problems, let's see if uh, uh, Natalia could uh, show us the results. But um, the, the goal of the presentation is uh, the discussion. Um, uh, we usually have one hour and 20 minutes of discussion. So we could still try to, uh, yeah, you could explain uh, the results and um, we could go to the discussion if um, we don't succeed. With the presentation yeah so uh, the presentation is in our dropbox natalia and it's qis as seminar 29 10 20 for the date perfect i have it here and it should be like slide 19 or something with the lab okay yeah i think it's opening it's behaving so far so good Runner up. There's not that many slides left, but five. Okay. Are we getting that working? I've put in the chat for everybody um, a book that came out last week, um, edited by Angelo Bassi, which is a sort of um, festschrift, a posthumous festschrift for the work of um, Girardi. And uh, it happens as a chapter in that that um, Natalia and Anna wrote. Eight Oxford questions. Um, so you're very welcome to uh, try and find that book if you can, it's published by Springer, it came out last week. And uh, the, the eight Oxford questions are about experiments in quantum foundations that we think would be feasible before too long. Ah, oh, success. Have you got it, Natalia? Uh, can you see now? Yes. Yeah. So just the low temperature uh, lab. Um, let me just um, put it in for. Is that it? Yes. yes. And next slide. Okay, there we are. Well, the fridge, you had to see it. Yes, <laughs> this is, this is the Andrew's lab, which we spent many, many hours in. And so. Um, you can see the dilution refrigerators, which is just look like uh, gray canisters on the outside. But on the inside, you can see the different temperature stages and uh, lots of cryogenic wiring. And so we first use the RF sample at these low temperatures to find the frequency that a membrane vibrates at when it's cooled down. And then we go to the 3D cavity. So next slide, please. And so here you can see a picture of one of our samples. Um, in a superconducting aluminium cavity. These cavities have been used for many things, such as cooling to the ground state of motion of these silicon nitride membranes. And you can also use our loop gap cavities to cool to the ground state of motion. And if you're interested in that work, please see the references in the bottom corner. 
And then we start to take some measurements. Next slide, please. So we find that the cavity has a resonance frequency of around six gigahertz in transmission, and it uh, has a quality factor of around 30,000, which corresponds to a line width of around 200 kilohertz. And then on the right hand side, you see some very, very preliminary measurements of the motion of the membrane. I say preliminary because this graph shows a number of issues we found with our setup. So the red trace, the large one, is taken with the pulse tube on. Now, the pulse tube is a central part of the working of a dilution refrigerator. However, we found that what it does is that it shakes the, shakes the machine and our membrane is very sensitive to this. So it picks up the vibrations and the motion is amplified, which is not good mm -hmm. if we want to find out its thermal motion or its temperature. So we turn the pulse tube off and try it again, which we can do for just a few minutes. And then we get the blue trace. However, this blue trace still has the pulse tubes of the other dilution refrigerators in the lab switched on. And if we switch off all of the pulse tubes in the lab, we can't see our peak in a spectrum analyzer because it has a line, uh, it has a measurement bandwidth of one hertz and our peak is um, narrower than this. So what we learn from this is that one, Taking data becomes very difficult. We have to switch off the pulse tubes of four dilution refrigerators and work within a few minute time window. And we have to take time domain measurements and Fourier transform them. And this is to increase the resolution of our measurements. Next slide, please. And so what we do is we demodulate the sideband from around just over six gigahertz right down to 40 hertz. This is a multi-step process, which is fairly involved and I can discuss it in the question time if any of you are interested. And then we convert the area of our peak to a mode, uh, to a phonon occupation, and we convert the phonon occupation to a mode temperature. And we do this for several different temperatures and several experimental runs. And then if we go to the next slide, we get some very, very preliminary results, which were our first attempt. And well, we can't really draw any conclusions from this, this data, but we can learn a lot. So the first thing is uh, we have very large error bars. So the error bars are obtained by doing two runs of the experiment and um, taking the difference between the data points. And what we can learn is that the membrane is not thermalizing with the environment, because if it were, the error bars would not be so large. In addition, we might also be picking up uh, spurious vibrations from the lab or I don't know if the road outside can affect it but um so vibration isolation is an issue um so if we go to the next slide um so for round two we want to incorporate more vibration isolation into the experimental setup what you can see on the right is a cryogenic vibration isolation platform uh which is the well, Natalia if you could just show the the platform it's the round wow. thing and then there's pieces which have been designed so that it can fit in the puck with the cavity. This should um, isolate the vibrations of the surroundings, uh, isolate the cavity from the vibrations in the surroundings. Um, we had some thermalization issues with it, so uh, we need to do further investigation into that. We also want to engineer a stronger coupling to the cavity to increase our signal to noise ratio a bit. Uh, this can be done by um, changing the engineering of the pins which uh, send the microwaves into the cavity. And we also want to engineer a stronger coupling between the membrane and the cavity. And this is done by reducing the gap between the membrane and the antenna. And if we go to the next slide, if we think about uh, future work that could be done, I kind of see that there's two separate avenues. So if we focus on this setup, we could think about using a denser material, maybe to explore the effect of the membrane shape, we utilize a different cryogenic setup. Maybe there are fridges which operate without pulse tubes. Or perhaps um, there's a, a different setup or even a yet to be thought of uh, experiment that is the absolute uh, way to go when thinking of answering these questions. And last slide, this has been a, a team effort. So I wish to thank Natalia Ares, Andrew Briggs, Gerard Milburn, Edward Laird and Kieran Kostler who have all worked very hard to to take these small steps in this direction. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you very much, Anna, for the very interesting presentation. And I must say that despite all the technical 
uh, issues, you are right on time. It was 35 minutes. <laughs> the, the that would be due to Andrew's training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so but by tradition, what, what we do is uh, we first allow, um, uh, we have a commentator that uh, asks first questions. It's usually a, a PhD student. And today uh, that would be Simone Rijavec, which is, who is, uh, Simone, are you uh, here? Yes. Good. Um, who is um, uh, working at Vladko Vedrals and Kera Marletos group. So your neighbors. Um, so Simone first asks a couple of questions to get the discussion going and then uh, we open the discussion to everybody. Yes. Uh, hi, Hannah. Uh, nice presentation. Very interesting. Um, so I have a couple of uh, first technical questions. Maybe I missed it. Uh, what temperatures are you working in with uh, the setup? So we, we do the experiment over a range of temperatures ranging from around uh, 20 millikelvin at base and around 900 millikelvin at the largest temperature. Uh, that's limited by um, the superconducting transition temperature of aluminium. So if we went above, say, 1.2 Kelvin, our cavity wouldn't be superconducting anymore. Right. Do you also have a requirement on the air pressure? Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, in a, it's in a vacuum. Um, 10 to the minus 6, is that right, Natalia? Yeah, but it's it doesn't require um, high vacuum, so it's it's really the the you know the um, basically uh, cryo pumping of our of our dilution refrigerators, uh, but certainly the the pressure has a strong impact in the quality factor of the membrane motion. Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah, that that's a, a further consideration uh, in this experiment for sure because the longer you you can keep the oscillations the longer you can average for, meaning the smaller the difference you would be able to detect in terms of heating. Mm -hmm. Yes. And on the uh, more conceptual side, I was wondering, so is this heating effect the same as the uh, one of the CSL? Is it uh, equivalent? It's not exactly the same. Uh, this one is just density dependent, whereas the CSL one depends on the shape of your object. Okay, just as okay. So okay, you, you could eventually like do a comparison between like distinguish uh, the, the two. I mean, I think so. Yeah. Uh, and okay, and and so uh, okay, but you, you don't make any any uh, claim of on the nature of uh, gravity based on the result. What what are your claims? No. Okay. No, the, the, the claim is this is um, an experiment we are setting out to to put a bound on this theory, but we don't have the data to put the bound yet. Yes, okay. So, so the thing is that, um, you know, this equation that Anna showed, which is which is great because it has um, of, of the um, uh, minimum um, heating rate, it's a great equation because it shows both the, um, you know, the gravitational constant and the uh, Planck constant in, this, in the same equation, which I think is, is fantastic. But that gives us, uh, th that's the, the derivation that has minimized the coupling, uh, let's say the measurement strength uh, between the, let's say the atoms that form the membrane. And therefore that value is very small. And uh, okay, there is no hope to measure that, that small value almost with anything that we can think of, any, any way that we can think of, but that's again, uh, you know, minimum bound. So we can, uh, we can put bounds on these and the bound that we can put now, it's rather not, not very useful at this point, but we are pushing towards um, better and better bounds and, and I think that's, that's um, a, a quite uh, important uh, shop to try and, and I feel like in CSL that you know, there are regimes in which it is now, um, well, you know, that we, we know it can't work. Well, uh, in the same way, we are trying to push these bounds to, um, to let's say, disprove, in some sense, uh, this uh, theory in some, in some regime. Okay. Yeah, also, okay. If I got it correctly, you're trying to find these bounds for this specific model. Uh, exactly. And, and we, what we found now is that we have, um, 
some limitations in the experiment that, that we have to work on to put a, a really tight bound. So we are, we are pushing that bound uh, more and more. And, 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 and to do so, you have to engineer the, the, the experiment to actually uh, go to its limits. Yes. OK, it's very, very interesting. Yeah, and yeah, because uh, it, my, my opinion on the topic is that it's not really clear, like there are many of these effects that could account for this uh, eating. So it could be like spontaneous collapse and various models from gravitational decoherence. But yeah, um, yeah, I think it, everyone is, is aiming at reducing this uh, bound, like reducing a region of uh, like detecting this. Effect. Yeah, exactly. Because you, you know, you can, you know, hope, you, you know that there is some, uh, there are other effects that you can quantify and say, well, you know, within this margin, I know this can't be happening. So um, that that's exactly what what we have been aiming to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you, Simone. Uh, the discussion is now open. Feel free to unmute and uh, ask a question. I have a question if I... Yeah, no, go ahead, Carlo. Okay, uh, yeah, I am unmuted. So first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Anna. That's, that was great, and thank you, Natalia. And, uh, the possibility of going experimentally into these things is, is, is fantastic for a theoretician like, like me. Um, I, I, my question is, uh, uh, it, it, it might be a follow-up of the last thing that Simone was talking about. I'm, I'm not sure. So it's it's completely from the theoretical uh, perspective. What exactly are, is being is being measured here, and what is what is the point here? So it's uh, uh, nothing to do with the details of the experiment. So um, what what is not completely clear to me is, is the following: um, Do do we have two or, or three? Um, theoretical models, theoretical uh, hypothesis in, in, in mind. And uh, uh, let me say what I mean and, 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 and what exactly we think. It seems to me that from, from the point of view of a theorist like me, uh, the theory that is supposed to describe what the, the physics you're doing that we have are, are two. Uh, maybe there is a third one, but that's... One is just uh, quantum gravity, which is basically in this regime the same uh, whether you do sort of perturbative uh, quantum generativity you do loop quantum gravity you do string theory you do uh, asymptotic uh, safety whatever you do the, the prediction is the same and the prediction is that uh, uh, gravity becomes quantum there's nothing like a gravitational collapse or anything like that so that's one theoretical uh, possibility and as a theoretician i would give it a sort of a how would I say, a Bayesian uh, uh, credibility right now, up to be modified, of course, uh, of 98% uh, or something like that. And then there are other possibilities, one being the Penrose, uh, uh, the, 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 the few variants of the Penrose DOZ or uh, gravitational collapse, which uh, would clearly be, if I get it right, uh, give a different physics here. And it seems to me you're distinguishing between these two. Uh, of course, there's a parameter here, so it's, uh, you're putting bounds on, 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 on that. Um, my question is, is just, is that what you're doing? So is that, are you distinguishing a, the, I said about the Bayesian possibility because from the point of view of the theoreticians, you, the, what you're doing is, uh, uh, sort of, you have a two percent probability, in my estimate, of getting a Nobel Prize for immediately for finding something absolutely spectacular, which is extremely unlikely on the basis of what we know, and ninety-eight percent the possibility of saying, "All right, so you know, this is not happening. It was a funny idea, unplausible idea. We've ruled it out, or we have decreased this Bayesian credibility for two percent to zero point one percent, or there is a third." Uh, or theoretically, you have a third possibility in mind beside those two, which you are somehow secretly testing or, or not secretly testing, uh, namely that uh, independently of the 
Penrose uh, gravitational collapse, uh, you're also testing something about uh, uh, something else about a possible quantum gravity effect. Well, how do we? How do you view this? Is that is that clear? My I'm encouraged my... by what you say, Carla. I think a two percent chance for Nobel Prize would be worth going for. You know. <laughs> no, 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 of course, <laughs> obviously so. I mean, I mean uh, wait, wait, let, let me let me add something. Uh, nothing of what I said uh, implies <laughs> that that you shouldn't do, or, or it's not incredibly good to do what you're doing. I mean, it is, uh, but I just want to understand what exactly we're doing here. So it's not a pen raise. It's obviously it's something to do. I mean, the fact that this can be done is fantastic. So it should be done. So it's it's not a pen raise model. So it's still open for another Nobel Prize that's different from Rogers. But um, I'll let, I'll let um, Anna and Natalia answer, and then I've got an answer, and I'll see if they've already covered it. But, but why don't Anna and Natalia go first? Anna, you, you want to go first? And um, Well, from, from what I under, understand of the theory, the idea is that um, with this model, uh, gravity is is not quantum. So all models of quantum gravity, uh, if I've understood it correctly, uh, would would not be true. And the, the gravity has this uh, this classical channel which cannot mediate entanglement, and thus um, we observe if we if we were to observe the heating effect predicted, we would be able to say gravity is classical at a fundamental level as I've understood it, but I'll let Natalia comment. Yeah, in some sense, it is it is the same, no? Uh, I mean, if, if we were to show, for example, that we can, you know, push this limit to push this bound uh, to, to uh, and say, well, no, this is not feasible, would be again, um, would be, I think, a, 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 another kind of strong argument for uh, for the, the view of, of quantum gravity. So in some sense, I think that it can be seen as a quantum gravity experiment in the sense that, well, you know, um, we are really putting uh, these to the test. And, and well, as, as Anna said, these experiments also answer other questions that have to do with, um, let's say, with the superposition of macroscopic objects and uh, and, and try to understand and the other fundamental questions on, on the way as well. So um, I think I think really um, pushing these, let's say, sensors to the limit would, would allow us to answer um, a, a lot of questions. Um, I don't know, Andrew, if that's what you... I, I, I'm sure that's right. So, so let me just give you a completely different way of thinking about it in terms of... Um, in terms of um, control theory, classical and quantum control theory. And if you're familiar with um, Gerard Milburn's book with Harold Wiseman, think of the sort of ideas that he was putting forward in that book. And the question is, is in terms of information theory, are we dealing with classical information or quantum information? So think of it in the original version where you had two objects, not just one. And this object wants information about the mass and position of that object. If you like, this object wants information about the distortion of space time due to that object. Now, that information comes from the distortion here, as it were around the back, but it can be in the front too, to this object. And similarly, the distortion of space time from this one, there's information about that that comes around to this object. Question, is that information quantum or is it classical? If the information is quantum, then you can think of it as one giant sized wave function, which has unitary of evolution as a wave function, and there would be no change in energy, no spontaneous heating effect. Alternatively, if it's actually a classical measurement and it's classical information, that's communicating the, the, the mass and position of this object to that one. Then there's some measurements that are going on, and those classical measurements have associated with them a heating effect. Therefore, if we measure a heating effect, then we can deduce that it's a classical information channel 
and gravity is mediated classically. But if it's quantum information, then, and well, sorry, if we detect no spontaneous heating effect, then we can say that it's quantum information and the mediation of the gravity is, is, is a quantum phenomenon. That's the distinction that we're seeking to test, Carlo. Yes. And uh, uh, yeah, so let me comment on what you said, Andrew, and what Natalia said. The, this perspective, the way you put it, it's, uh, I find it extremely interesting, somehow more interesting than uh, testing a peculiar, strange hypothesis about gravitational collapse. In a way, so maybe that's exactly where I wanted to, to, to go. Uh, for, from my perspective, suppose you get a negative result from this, uh, it's much more interesting because, uh, I mean, you maybe don't get the Nobel Prize tomorrow morning, but it's much more interesting yeah, physically. <laughs> yeah, but you get it the next step because uh, somehow, it, because that's uh, evidence, indirect evidence, perhaps not, but even direct evidence for actually quantum uh, properties of gravity, uh, quantum behavior of gravity. So uh, somehow, I, I, I would see what you're doing, not so much testing one specific model about, you know, uh, physical collapse, uh, but finding, evi finding evidence uh, to the fact that, as you're saying, Andrew, the, the, the exchange of information between the two, the, the, the two masses cannot be classical, it's quantum, because there is no this. Uh, that's I would find extremely interesting. So it's cl closer in spirit, in a sense, to what Simone's group is doing. Uh, look, we, we do have evidence of, of, of quantum behavior of gravity, which piles up with uh, what you expect theoretically. That was my comment. Thanks. Yeah, that, I think that's uh, that's fantastic, and and you know what what also links to Simone's work is that uh, you know in this you could think of in, uh, of entangling uh, then masses through gravity, and then you go one step further. Yeah. And I really like that paper. It's just that uh, experimentally it's a bit ambitious, <laughs> but we're we're getting there. <laughs> Great, thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you, Kevin. I love it. Then I like it more somehow. From this. <laughs> yeah. Maybe one. Uh, can I make? Uh, yeah, one one comment slash questions about that is that, I mean, this discussion that we're having here, um, uh, we're having you know it now in two thousand and twenty. But if you think for for a minute about it, this is a question that was very fierce a hundred years ago. It's exactly this. I mean, the question you're asking is that matter is quantum and then we have fields. Well, if matter is quantum, should the field be quantum? So, uh, and the analogy is profound. That is the notion of electric charge, you know, is, is promoted to the notion of gravitational charge, which is the mass. So of course the details and the, the technology involved are, but conceptually there's really absolutely no difference between the debate we're having now and the debate that was taking place and resolved uh, more than a hundred years ago. So it would be interesting to look at it from an experimental point of view. That is gravity from that perspective, that question and the technology you're, you're probing uh, is not so different from that debate. It would be interesting to see what, what kind of a uh, resolution took place then and, and what we could do with the technology today. Okay, I mean, there's, a, there's an order, I mean, I'm a theorist here. So for me, mass and charge, okay, well, if I rescale the units, they, they have exactly the same effects. <laughs> and okay, no, no, for you, this is a different problem. But, but what I'm thinking is that it, it might be interesting to, to look at the, the ideas we have today for testing gravity versus what people did or how they got the evidence that, well, you know, uh, if the charge is quantized, then the field has to be quantized. Uh, I don't know how much of that debate is integrated into the, um, the experimental, uh, you know, community, yeah. because 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 of the, I mean, the coupling constants are so different, but fundamentally, this is exactly the same thing, right? Yeah, no, totally, and I think and I think that's what it's exciting that I think uh, we get closer and closer to being able to 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 make that jump and 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 put to the test these ideas that um, that were before just thought experiments. Uh, so I think what's what's changing is that we have more control over over 
over systems and 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 we can do more and and hopefully you know we 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 really um are, are pushing those limits every day and and mm -hmm. i think that's that's what um it's exciting i mean if you see the experiments of the charge of the electron they are just you know you think oh my how, how they manage at that time to do it and you, you you just say oh i wish i wish i would have thought about that um and i think we are we are um at, at that time in in a sense that uh, you know we we are really pushing the limits of what what we can do and and as uh, with experiments uh, with electrons for example there are technologies that were really enabling like the vacuum you know once once you could uh, get the vacuum to certain levels, you could see these effects that before you couldn't. Uh, and and now we are we are really thinking, well, which are the tools now that we can uh, that we can use to see th to see effects that that until now we weren't able to and 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 expose these effects or or at least um, what we can do as we were, uh, saying before is, is is to disprove some effects and and and, and make the the, the a, a more solid basis uh, mm -hmm. to what to what we think uh, are, are the the theories that are more um, promising. I think for me, Laurent, the, um, the the what was a personal surprise for me is the the ability to do nanoscale experiments would help. So I hadn't expected it would. So. Normally, we think that gravity is such a weak effect that if you want to get more and more sensitive, you have to go bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. yeah, like yeah. Cavendish did, like Boyd did. So let's make it bigger and bigger because the effect is so weak. And of course, then you've got to scratch your head and you say, well, quantum effects are um, manifest most obviously when you go smaller and smaller. So now you've got a mismatch. So that's why it's hard to investigate quantum gravity. And the surprise for me was that by going smaller and smaller, we could get greater and greater sensitivity mm -hmm. to gravitational effects. That I had not expected. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and I think that's very remarkable. And that's why I think this mm -hmm. is a very exciting direction to pursue. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. It's, it's very exciting. Uh, um, I don't know what I may be suggesting. I, I would love to see some kind of historical perspective that is a an electromagnetic versus gravitational analogy where where somehow the surprises you're describing for gravity were already exper experienced and maybe i don't know an analogy for maybe natalia knows that in the experiments which are done today you know what are, what would be the, the electromagnetic analog and vice versa is there experiment that people have done in electromagnetism that might bring i don't know new ideas or is there yeah. some purely quantum gravitational experiment that have no uh, electromagnetic analog. I think uh, I mean, it will require an interesting historical. I would love to see that talk. About. But Lauren, we'll let Deepak come in. But, but the reason the the comparison is difficult to apply is that the electric forces are so big. So you can readily detect one electron. You can detect the force due to one electron. That that's readily accessible. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's accessible. I agree. I agree. But there is there is. Other, yeah, but that's that's, um, but that's not the only way. In fact, this 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 is not how um, um, the 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 proof of interaction that the electromagnetic was quantum was done. You know, the, the what you this, the experiment you're describing was done 50 years after the discovery of the quantization. The discovery of quantization was much more smart. You could you know like indirect and with some. Uh, I mean, if you think, if you go back to the technology of 1910, right? I mean, that, that's, uh, anyway. I, I, I know with the technology of today, it's very easy. What I'm saying is that maybe, I don't know, maybe the historical analysis might bring us some interesting analogy. Well, 1910, yeah. people could readily detect no. force due to one electron, you see. That was, that was readily available in 1910. Detecting the force, the gravitational force due to one electron, you know, is hopeless. There's no way we can do it. Well, uh, that, that is where I want to uh, oh, yeah, jump in, if I'm... Yeah. Uh, so, no, what, what, what Laurent is asking, right, it's, it's a really uh, important question, which is that, uh, you know, so in the Millikan oil drop experiment, for example, right, I mean, in a way, it is already utilizing uh, both gravity and 
uh, electromagnetism, right? I mean, you're using the weight of the oil drop and, and conquering that with the repulsion due to the charge of the oil drop, right? Now, uh, but there the, the issue is that the that oil drop itself is a completely classical object, right? So, and as such, there is no coupling between the oil drop and the electron. The, it's just a, you know, a, a carrier. But, but there is a way in which uh, one, one can uh, couple this, the, these two systems together. And uh, so this, this is an idea due to um, this uh, person in, in, in one of the University of California branches, I forget his name. Uh, but basically it involves that if you take uh, a droplet of superconducting, uh, a superfluid helium, okay? So such a droplet, for example, would be uh, maybe mesoscopic in size, right? And if you consider two such droplets, uh, then the then the force, the gravitational force between them would be uh, perhaps uh, you know of the similar scale to the uh, Coulomb uh, force between two electrons. And so the idea is that you take an electron and you put it on a on a on the surface of a helium droplet, superfluid helium droplet. And then uh, you take another droplet like that, right? And so you have those two effects. Now you have, you have the gravitational force between the helium droplets, right? Which is, uh, you know, one can, I guess, do a back of the envelope calculation and see, but I think it'll, you, you, you know, how big the helium droplets have to be for the forces to be comparable. And then the thing is that um, if, if you want to look at the, the, the effects of, of gravity, because it's, it's, a, it's in a superfluid state, right? So it's in a coherent quantum state, right? So there are no uh, dissipative effects. Uh, thermal, thermal uh, which, you know, which would normally cause uh, dissipation uh, in, in, for example, uh, this was, I think, the problem in, 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 in the experiments by Weber, right? Uh, the, the bar experiments where he was trying to detect gravitational waves. So in this case, because the superfluid droplet is in a coherent state, you won't have that issue. So such a setup maybe could uh, uh, help answer some some of these questions. So wow! I'll, I'll yeah. Have to go back and yeah. yeah that, that that's a very interesting experience. Super difficult. <laughs> I kind of think how one would do it, but um, but yeah, that that would be great. I, and I think the um, in the Indeed, in, in all these experiments, the, these electromagnetic forces, uh, well, ele or electrostatic forces, are always uh, are always present, and one has to um, re really, you know, either they become part of the experiment, or or you have to fight them in some way. Um, but yeah, those are 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 well. That's that's a, a very interesting experiment to have in mind, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I have a, okay, I have a question. Um, it's a theory question. It's about, part of what I was saying is that, you know, at some level uh, in the regime where we're testing gravity, there's no difference between some of gravity and electromagnetism. I mean, there may be deeper, but so that's why the, the, the question whether it's quantum classical. But if I try to emphasize what, what is so different, there is one thing where, where gravity is different from electromagnetism. And I was wondering whether that could give us an edge and, and and experimentally. So the one thing where gravity is fundamentally different than electromagnetism is that there is no gravitational screening. Exactly, right? yes. Uh, the mass yeah. is only positive. So there is no, you cannot build a Farad you cannot. gravitational Faraday cage, <laughs> but you can. So, and otherwise it's exactly like, it, gravity is the same thing as electromagnetism where all the charges are positive, right? There's exactly. really, at, the, at the level you're experimentally working, it's the same thing. So could we use that? that one theory admits a screen and the other one does not. Uh, yes. In what and, way and can I, we, yeah. Yes, and, and I think that's a, that's a, a very good, so, so actually one of these um, experiments that Anna showed in, in one of her slides, they, they show two masses which are getting closer and they have some such, some uh, electromagnetic, of course, this is an illustration. It's not a real experiment, it's a proposed experiment, but they have some shield 
uh, by which you can you can actually um, uh, you know just just screen against electro uh, against ele electrostatic forces, but but the, the gravity wouldn't be uh, you wouldn't be able to screen that force, and 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 that's exactly what that's uh, aiming for. So yeah, I think that's a that's an excellent point because uh, you would always have these electrostatic forces. So can, how can you tell? And I think that's a that's a great way to tell. Uh, I mean, you can try and 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 shield from uh, electrostatic forces, but not from gravity. And I, 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 that, that that's a that's a very good um, yeah. That that's indeed a very good point. Um, if I may <clears throat> jump in, if it, um, if who is it? Else, if this is Carlo, if nobody else is, uh, I, I don't want to monopolize the discussion, but if there's nobody else's, may I go? I was going to ask a question, but after you. Oh, oh, go ahead, uh, Marius. I'll, I'll wait. Okay. I, I mean, it's, uh, it was about, uh, um, you know, the things we did together. So. Um, <laughs> yes, so I am thinking also about uh, what Laurent said. Let me, let, me, let me put it this way. So when uh, Vladko and Chiara and Suka Dubos proposed this experiment, the question we asked with Carlo was, uh, um, this seems to work out, which implies that these people are saying they can do a tabletop experiment Although Natalia is saying it's a difficult one, but again, it's an imaginable. Uh, and uh, this has no high energy involved. There is no uh, big bang or black holes in it, but they are saying this has something to do with quantum gravity because it can say whether uh, the gravitational field um, obeys quantum mechanics. And we're like, okay, why? What, what is the gravity, quantum gravity scale there? And we did a, an analysis and we saw that actually this was related to Planck mass. Um, there is a play between Planck mass and Planck time. Then we followed up on this and um, we're doing a couple of works. We see that um, Planck mass is somehow in the game and also in, uh, in Penrose's models, he's playing with the Planck mass, which is like the charge as Loran was saying. So, I haven't got my head around what is going on in your experiment. My question is simply, is there, does the mass play a role of, um, of uh, what is this thing that is oscillating there? You were saying that um, the effect is dominated by L and C, the capacitance and the inductance. But I was wondering if uh, the mass of something is coming into this or not. It's the, so the, the heating rate is dependent on the density of your object, the, the mass density. Higher density means higher resolution? A uh, higher density means a larger heating rate. So a bigger change in temperature. But so it's on the density, it's not on the mass. Yes, the density. So how closely the atoms, in, because in this experiment, it was um, a composite test mass. So the, the spacing between the atoms makes the difference. But this city doesn't change so much in nature in solid materials, right? No, so if you did it for a material of one density and then did it for a material of a different density, provided you had the precision and everything, you should you should see a different a different number. I see. But somehow what I'm saying is you cannot go to very higher densities, right? No. Yeah. Okay. I will uh, okay. I will um, try to think in this direction. Um, Carlo, yep, you can go. Well, um, the question I wanted to ask is the same as Marius. Uh, I exactly wanted to ask the same question, but I'm not happy with the answer, Anna. So uh, can we continue a little bit about the, the Planck mass here? Because uh, the, if there's a density involved, uh, the Planck density is just totally outside anything you can think about. <laughs> the Planck density is, uh, it's, uh, you, you need to squeeze the universe, the entire universe in a, in, in a soccer ball to get the Planck density. So we, we're, uh, um, if you just use H bar and G and C, 
uh, you know, you, you can get uh, Planck length, which is very small, Planck time, which is extremely small, Planck energy, which is super large, Planck density, which is unbelievably, and then you can get a Planck mass with a microgram. I mean, you know, point something micrograms. Uh, now, you say that in your, in your equations, H bar and G come in. Uh, I, I guess they don't come multiplied, they come divided by the, the ratio of the two that comes in. So in, if, you, if you, instead of writing H bar over G, you write M Planck, no, you say it's, three, They times each other. It's H bar times G. It's H bar times G. Uh, Natalia can go to the slide. Yes. I can. Ten to the minus thirty-three centimeters. You can't so see. it's I mean, just... it's it's very tiny. It's it's a very tiny effect. Um, no, but wait, wait. But Ten to the minus thirty-three centimeters is not very tiny. It's outside anything you can do in the lab, including. It would be good to see the equation. Yes. So I mean, let it me. Cannot be. There is some other h bar somewhere. There should be an h bar over g or g over h bar. That plays a role. Otherwise, it's just, you don't do anything so, connected to gravity, to quantum gravity. So, In fact, the same happened with uh, with uh, with uh, um, the, the, the 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 masses uh, the interference experiment. Uh, there's an h bar of g. If you just dig into it, uh, you you can express exactly. Uh, the, the the effect that the ratio of a mass involved over the Planck mass times some other experimental. Uh, uh, so I, if I re remember it correctly, it's H bar G uh, times the crystal structure, which is S, which is just a water unity. We we don't need to worry about it, and the density of the material. And it it just comes from the Hamiltonian, so there is no quantum gravity here involved at all. It's just thinking of. Uh, the let's say the um, the van der Waals van der Waals force between between the atoms. So so let's say the derivation it's it's very classical. Well, not classical, of course, because we uh, that that's where the H bar comes from from just the Hamiltonians. Uh, but let's say there is no uh, quantum field involved in the derivation. That's for sure. So that's why we don't have a mass Planck appearing. Um, but um, but yeah, let's say this, this is, let's say the, 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 the minimum prediction, uh, the minimum bound that this, that this theory predicts, but, um, but yeah, uh, uh, there is no, because it's not a quantum uh, gravity approach. We, let's say that we, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, we, we don't have this, this, um, the, the mass Planck involved. Uh, the, the Planck mass can sneak in. I mean, um, um, it's not uh, actually clear where it is in Lucan gravity, for instance. Uh, it, it's sort of sneaked in in this um, approach, uh, this, uh, how to say, in this experiment of gravity mediated entanglement. Uh, would you would you have this equation? Could we see the slide? Maybe. Yeah. Sure. Uh, um, we can. Uh... Just to try to get some understanding of what really I can show you. Yeah. I'm really interested to, to, to understand if Carlo thinks there's something missing. Bearing in mind, Carlo. Oh, oh, I've seen, I'm not saying there's something missing. I think you can look at what you're doing for this. You have an Hamiltonian, uh, which is an, a, a sort of a, a standard Newtonian interaction energy, which, ah. the story, which is proportional to G. Right, so you have, you have a piece of the Hamiltonian which is proportional to G. Just think in terms of path integral. You have e to the i g over h bar because of the action divided. But that's the is that g over h bar that should play some some role. I'm surprised that mm -hmm. you to say that you it can, is not there in any sense. So okay. let me let me show you the derivation. I think I have it here, if I may. So, so we, we start with the, uh, well, this is, this is, I must say, this is all Kieran's work um, that has been, Kieran Koshla working with, which are Melbourne, but I think it's in your thesis, Anna, is that right? Uh, yeah, he allowed me to include the derivation in the appendix, um, okay. but the, the thesis isn't out yet, so. Um, okay, but, but then we, 
it would appear like, it would appear in your thesis and we can we can distribute it but um so so here it starts with with the hamiltonian and in the hamiltonian basically we have all these yeah. all these particles yeah. and then um yeah i see well, i see they could be there just square you square uh yes i think it comes from the the mutual bi she and up let me try and get this m squared just for m squared okay yeah um so so here we start calculating the heating rate well and um and basically the problem is that we don't know um let's say this this gamma zero uh, which is the strength of of the measurement and then by minimizing that uh, we we get let's say a minimum heating rate um, that as you can see it's just dependent on um, on h bar and g uh, and and from there we get the minimum heating rate and s is just a parameter that that has to do with the geometrical disposition of the right but that's not necessarily in contradiction with what uh, okay I'll, I'll look at this at least I, I look at these equations we would uh, we would uh, send you an thesis Carlo I think uh, yeah, everything yeah, is very yeah, nicely yeah. explained there oh sorry yeah I think, Carlo you're, you're thinking of experiment here here it involves an, a change in energy versus a density and that's why it's proportional to the plant length whereas you're thinking of kind of fundamental you know where you have uh, I don't know just just position you know you have only fundamental objects where the, the because here the density can reabsorb a lot of this land. So it's kind of a different. Uh, uh, hmm. Now, now I, I, don't know, I don't know what is the. Yeah, you have, you have a density times the Planck length, right? That's essentially your. So you have this subject, which is an energy, a mass divided by L square. And I, it, it's not clear to me what it means that it's small or big in some sense, right? That's the. It could still be, right? It's, it's yes. Divided by length square, which is a uh, really measure there, and that's uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so so uh, to get a sense of what it means for that object to be big or small is uh, maybe we need to think for a minute. It's not the usual, right? Anyway, uh, let's just the take question, the, the answer program, the question right? by, by Marius and by oh. myself. Uh, I'll look at this equation, and uh, I, I'm curious to see because if, as Andrew was saying. Um, the non-happening of the, uh, uh, the, the, the coherence, uh, it's due to the fact that there is a, 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 a quantum superposition of, of gravitational fields, essentially. So the two masses talk in a quantum way, not in a classical way. Um, then there is a, a, a quantum gravity effect that you're actually seeing in, in, in some sense. And uh, uh, it, if there's some sort of quantum gravity effect, it cannot be a Planck scale effect, a Planck length, because that's too small. But again, uh, I do expect quantum gravity effect of that kind around uh, masses which are micro uh, grams, which is not too far which from the not, kind. We're about 200 working. nanograms. So I'm not exactly. So I'm not surprised by the fact that Andrew is saying, what, what, "What? How can we do something? How can we say something related to gravity when everybody knows that gravity uh, related to quantum gravity? When everybody knows that this requires energies uh, which are far above our mass scale or lengths which are far above below our scale? Well, you, you're right at the at the at the at the size where we expect the mass." Uh, quantum gravity effect related to the things which are that mass. So I I expect that maybe there is a way of reviewing that, but I, I cannot say. So I'll go to your equations and we can just all think of them still. Well, Carla, I hope we'll wrestle with this, but the crucial thing, at least within this experimental test, is that if it's a quantum effect, whatever the numbers are, it doesn't matter because the answer is zero. So zero times anything is still zero. Oh. Okay. So it's only the classic, it's only if the gravity is classically mediated that we'll get a non-zero answer in this experiment. 
Well, but it might be that we can see uh, right. another effect, that something else that we can measure that would, you know, give us a hint if these effects are there, and I, uh, that that would be um, fantastic. But look, the entire motivation of Penrose's proposal, if you talk with Roger, and you ask why do you think there could be something that happens when you take, you know, uh, a mass, you 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 put it in a superposition, and it. Uh, his, his answer is uh, because the Planck mass, it, it is at, at the microgram. And that's where we see quantum stuff stopping being quantum because that's a, because gravity, because the Planck mass is a, it's, a, it's at the microgram, it's, a, it's, a, it's creating the, the it's, 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 it's classicizing everything which is above that in some sense. That was original Roger intuition for his, for his idea. So his entire idea was something happens at at the at, at, at the Planck mass. Well, maybe that's something we should test, but it would be testing a different thing from what. Yeah, I understand. No, I understand. I understand. But it's it's okay. it's it's funny, you know, that when you say in micrograms, it sounds huge for us because I don't know. Our I think the nanotubes are ten to the minus twenty one grams i think or or 20 grams i cannot remember exactly the number uh, and and you said Anna, these are 200 nanograms that I was the right so. I, th that. I think if i'm i'm think so i mean i it's i need to double check yeah, but i think it's 200 nanograms of the order of that the, the figure to bear in mind natalia is that 10 nanometers long of a nanotube is a yoctoliter of volume okay <laughs> Wow. <laughs> <Convenient> units. <laughs> yeah, so the fact that we can make devices out of these objects, I think. But this, but this is because it's hard to put quantum masses in superposition. So of course you cannot be big masses in superposition. You you can easily put small masses in quantum superposition. No, so you want Carlo, no, we don't allow the word easily in our laboratory. It's not no. <laughs> <laughs> right. You can put a photon. A photon is a small mass, right? In a simple position, rather easily. Um, uh, so you want to go up. Uh, in, uh, the masses that you put in some position, you want to go up. Mm -hmm. So where toward where you want to go up? Uh, I think to, to get to the interesting physics, somehow you have to toward uh, toward a microgram, and then you have some some other small numbers in your lab to to correct from the microgram down to where you arrive. Mm -hmm. um, but I may be wrong here. I don't know. I, I, I'm convinced that the Planck mass should be the key for thinking about these things. Yeah. Uh, so, but I'm wrong. Completely wrong. Not, it's not completely clear to me because uh, maybe I'm wrong in interpreting your experiment, Natalia Andrew, but. For me, the way I read what you're saying, it's it's kind of a dissipation experiment. It's go, if I go back to the classical electrodynamic analogy, if I assume the electromagnetic field is is classical, then the electron will spiral. Right? There will be dissipation, like the the atom would collapse, and we can see for the electricity. And in, if I understand your the philosophy behind your experiment, it's the same thing. If there's a classical channel and it's not quantum, there will be a secular effect, which is dissipation. And and yeah, yeah and it, you know, if you, if you calculate, in fact, it's interesting, calculate the Bohr dissipation from quantum gravity while it's bigger than the lifetime of the universe. So that's not a good, you know, the fact that the atom is stable is not a proof that gravity is, is quantum, but, you know, I think looking for systems where, where um, yeah, am I correct to, and well, then I don't know if that really matches the type of experiment that Carlo has in mind, which are really about measuring quantum gravity effects. But in mind, I can tell you the, the um, history of ideas here was that if you take the, um, the continuous spontaneous localization, you could try to uh, measure a spontaneous collapse of the wave function. And Philip Pearl's insight was, no, no, don't try to measure that. Look for the smoking gun. And the particular smoking gun that he proposed is that you have a disc, a suspended disc, and you look at the angular motion of the disk. And if CSL applies, then you will get a, a spontaneous heating effect in the 
fluctuation of the angular orientation of the disk. So that, that was a, 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 an idea that I learned from Philip Pearl. And so here, it's a similar thing. We don't try to look directly for the quantum effect of gravity, but we look for this sp smoking gun mm -hmm. of the energy raising rate mm -hmm. if gravity is mediated classically. But whatever the mass is, whatever the other numbers, it's multiplied by zero if it's a quantum mediated gravitational effect. Yeah, I see, I see the point. I have a quick question related to that. Um, you, you just mentioned spontaneous collapse and Natalia, you also mentioned that you use G GWR in um, building the model. So my question would be, um, are you not testing both um, classical gravity and GWR at the same time? And if you use some different interpretations that theory, so for example, for pilot wave theories, what do you expect to happen with with classical gravity, would it be something different or same? So Anna, do you wanna, because we talked about this so I, many times. I think um, you could use this experiment to test CSL type theories, but you'd have to do calculations based on the specific geometry. And we haven't done those calculations, but I, I think in principle they could be done. Um, with regards to Bohmian mechanics, I don't, we haven't kind of discussed every, interpretation on, on how it would. For those who are interested, um, Andrew Steen and I did some um, calculations on CSL for an osmium sphere in an iron trap. Osmium because it's the highest density material known. And uh, what we, we, tried, we tried to incorporate, well, we looked at six other possible causes of heating three of which we could discount as probably so small as to be negligible, three of which uh, would be appreciable. And we put in the most realistic numbers we could for those three effects. And we concluded that for an osmium sphere of, of optimal size, measuring a heating rate using the GRW parameters would be within reach if you had a large checkbook. In other words, it was not physically ruled out, but it was beyond the sensitivity that has currently been achieved in an iron trap. And I, I referenced that paper on the slides uh, with the iron trap proposals, if you want to look it up. Since uh, there are so many nice experimentalists here, I just want to ask a question, uh, if I may. How? How difficult is it to manipulate uh, droplets of superfluid helium, and how how big can can one go with such droplets before you know? Deepak, can you tell us what the units you would like difficulty measured in? Um, well, uh, what units? I, I don't. So, so, the, no, so no belong. I don't know. Yes. So just to measure the the resonance of of this uh, membrane with, uh, we had 10 millihertz precision, which was limited by measurement time. So we could probably go down to one millihertz precision. Took about 11 pieces of equipment and probably four months to get the setup. And, uh, and the setup's on the slide if you want to show it, Natalia. But um, so uh, just to yeah, measure I, a resonance is, is non-trivial um, with I high precision. With superfluid helium, I, I don't know where you'd start, but uh, maybe no, my, my just... question is that uh, how how big how big can you make uh, how big can you make droplets of superfluid helium in the lab? I we we you know we we don't work with uh, um, with with superconducting helium in the lab, so we we wouldn't we wouldn't know. But I know that is um, I think it's Keith Schwab and also I think Edward uh, Led is is exploring um, liquid helium. Uh, and and how to how to measure um, and 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 control those droplets. Um, so I'm I'm afraid we won't be able to give an answer to that on how how you know and and how close they they are. I know that I think that there are a few experiments with like films of let's say very like um, you know very thin layers of helium of superconducting helium. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not so sure about droplets, um, mm -hmm. 
and and I can't think of an, an easy way to do it, but um, but but I'm sure that there is people uh, that are experts in super in superconducting helium that that uh, would give you a much better answer. I I I don't know. I'm afraid. Do you know of any? Can, can you well, suggest I, any I, names? There are nice, uh, I think, uh, if I'm not wrong, um, I think it's Schwab uh, has done some... Schwab with, in Caltech, you mean? Yes. with not, not, not currently in his lab. He may have done some in the past, but not currently as far as I know. It, it might be. I uh -huh. think he has a few papers on superconducting cavities and... Deepak, I can... He's done superconducting cavities, but I don't think there was superfluid helium in them. And what I, they or maybe there were another experiment. Well, I I I can check and and then uh, also I know of uh, Edward Laird, who's a colleague that has been involved in this experiment as well uh, in Lancaster. What um, what is the last name? Uh, Laird. He was on the Anna's last slide, but Deepak, let me tell you the direction I think the field is going in because this may inspire your 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 thinking. Um, what the direction is going in is very small objects vibrating at very high frequencies in liquid helium. So let me give you um, some actual numbers. You can think of um, a nano... Andrew, cut out, just as he was telling me the... Can you hear me now? Is my voice working? Uh, no? I can. I can, but... Uh... Sorry, my internet connection, I think, is, is, is yes. messed up. So Deepak, can you hear me again now? No, I think you've lost think us. We've Deepak. lost. Let's have another discussion. Or, or how are we doing for time? I, I have a question. Well, I mean, can you finish what you were saying? It sounded really exciting. <laughs> Is Deepak back on again now? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm so sorry. It's. It's almost as if you know. Uh, so because Deepak, you were telling me about something inspiring, and then the, the internet decided to, to cut it out right at that moment. So. <laughs> the direction the experiments are going in, in superfluid helium, is very small objects vibrating at very high frequencies. So now you can think in terms of the relationship between um, wavelength and object size, if you like, the kind of considerations that um, John Strutt uh, was looking at when he came up with Rayleigh scattering, because what was important was the, the relationship between the wavelength and the size of the object. And to give you some numbers, you can think of uh, nanometer diameter objects, for example, a, a, a single wall carbon nanotube, so diameter about a nanometer or two, but vibrating at hundreds of megahertz or higher. So from that, you can deduce some wavelengths in, in superfluid helium, and you can think how those relate to the size of this object. And I think that what we'll see in the next few years is people pushing those experiments and learning a great deal more about this regime. Yeah, so I, I can show you, for example, uh, let me share these for a second. For example, I think these were experiments, well, this is um, a paper by Keith Schwab in, in 2017. <laughs> right. Okay, the wow, kind, okay. The kind of, he has a, like a cell with the helium-4 inside, but it, it's, um, it, it's quite bulky. Oh yes, thanks Natalia, I'd forgotten about that. Thanks for reminding me of that one. Uh, but, uh, one, one but yeah, can, you scroll, can you scroll back up a little bit just to see what the size of that is? Yeah, this is for measuring gravitational waves, but um, right. uh, but yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's uh, what what Andrew uh, also was saying that um, I think Edward is also qu quite interested in, in measuring. Edward Led is is in measuring these different, um, let's say, length scales with high frequency resonators. So that's a bit what, um, as as Andrew was saying, where, where the field is going and trying to probe. Um, the the these um, these phases of of helium um, very accurately. So again, because we have these nanoscale resonators that are so good, you can probe uh, at at very small length scales what what happens in these in these liquids. What what is the last name of that um, 
name you mentioned edward oh, uh, what uh, edward I, I i would put it in the chat Rima alpha yeah, india romeo delta uh, everyone it's also on the last slide um, there we are oh okay 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 i see i see i see i see, I see. thank you thank you Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, those are very interesting experiments and I think there is scope for, for a lot of fundamental um, questions to answer, both both for the superconducting uh, helium itself, uh, for, for the liquid helium itself and, and, different, and different types of helium. Right, right, right. Uh, and, and I think, yeah, I, I think Keith Schwab's work is probably related, is based on uh, what I mentioned earlier, which is work by Raymond, Raymond Kao. So he is a physicist at uh, UC Merced. I, I don't know what the status is right now, but uh, where he is. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. So so that that brings us back actually to what we are saying before of really having better sensors. No. So the moment we have better sensors and uh, that we can um, we can take to to the limits of um, of how uh, we can measure different quantities in in these systems. Um, then, then we can start answering um, all, all these questions and hopefully we can shine light a bit on, on gravity as well. But it seems they're using several kilograms of liquid helium. Yes. <laughs> so that, that's, uh, on, yeah. so it, it's, it's tricky to do these experiments, of course. Um, yeah. yeah. But, um, it's, it's basically a, 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 a superconducting Weber bar. I think. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That, that's don't, don't ask for several kilograms of helium-3 because that would use up the whole of your Nobel Prize and more. So, I don't think the Nobel Prize really may make much sense anymore. You know, that's not the case. Roger, Roger Penrose should have uh, gotten it with Stephen Hawking. And uh, I think I think they they just woke up to the fact that uh, if they didn't give it to Roger Penrose uh, after not giving to Stephen Hawking, they would end up looking like bigger fools than they already did. So they, I mean, I mean, I mean, Roger is quite quite old, right? I mean, he's like, you know, I mean. It means we shouldn't lose hope, right? Cross. We have a lot of time to win the Nobel Prize, Steve. And everything. <laughs> That's well, good. Natalia, you're in better position than than us. <laughs> if, you have to wait, if you have to wait 60 years for from the discovery <laughs> to the Nobel Prize, since, since the, you know the discovery hasn't been made, I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, I think one thing we should we should uh, be grateful for is that uh, is that Roger Penrose got it and not uh, Leonard Susskind. I, I mean, I mean, I would be very happy if Suskin got it, but I mean, it's, in some ways, this is a bit of a repudiation of the, or, or a you know, vindication of. of, of, of. Mm -hmm. But what, what Natalia is being really um, restrained in telling you is that last year, Natalia and I had dinner with Roger Penrose, and that was before the Nobel Prize Committee recognized his uh, worth. <laughs> Yeah, he came to mm -hmm. he came to our lab. Mm -hmm. He was there. Oh, okay. We shook hands. Yeah. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, sir to Kadin, I just uh, would like to see if there is anybody of the people remaining that wants to ask a question to Anna, or Natalia and Andrew. Hi, I would like to ask a, a um, theoretical question about the structure of the theory. If that's okay. Uh, I don't know who would like to answer. Uh, so my question is, uh, oh, hi, Anna. Um, and uh, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, and you know, the question is, that, um, there are these uh, theories like the um, theory by uh, Bose and Vlad Covedral and Chiara Maretto and those theories which uh, want to like show that gravity is quantum. And then there's the other theory that you guys have been testing, which are showing, want to show that or kind of the experiment is to, to prove or potentially prove uh, classical um, gravity. So I want to understand like the, the relationship between those theories. So are they like logically inconsistent? So, so let's say that what, um, you guys actually show that, uh, find some bound on, on this uh, heating rate and then say gravity is classical. Then does it mean that logically it is impossible for 
for the other um, guys to to go and do an experiment and show that actually gravity is is quantum uh, with with um, the BMV effect, or, or are there like, or are the assumptions in the two theoretical models different enough that there exists some gray area in between, where we would not be able to, even with positive results in both experiments, be able to tell uh, what is the nature of gravity? Well, look, um, here, um, uh, since all experiments are easy by definition. It's very easy to do an experiment to test for quantum gravity, all right? You just take two objects and you ensure that there are no interactions between them except for a gravitational interaction. And you demonstrate that you can, using the gravitational interaction alone, create entanglement. So it's easy, all right? You've shown that gravity is quantum. Okay. So you could do that this weekend. <laughs> um, so, Yes, but so what Claire is uh, asking, I think, is related to what we were asking before, though, Andrew. Uh, somehow, um, let me see. Let's say that I understand what you're saying, that the effect, um, uh, you know, it, let's assume that uh, gravity is quantum, then you will never see this effect. Um, but you can uh, do better and better and better as time goes on, right? You can do this experiment with better resolution. Um, is there some uh, scale at which, you know, if you keep on, let's imagine people keep doing this experiment. Um, is there some point where we will give up and say, okay, uh, since we're not seeing this dissipation, then uh, gravity must be quantum. Yes, it's 10 to the minus 41 watts. Okay, why? What's that? That's the calculated number from, from the derivation for this system. But I think the question is... Um, oh, sorry, sorry, can you explain that? I didn't... I... So if you put in the parameters H bar G mu S for the silicon nitride membrane, the number you get is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 41 watts. So it's very, very tiny, but that's the minimum bound. But I think Ria's question is that is if the minimum bound for, <coughs> for the, the heating you expect to get from the classical gravitational interactions. But I think- Oh, so you cannot get something less than that? No. And where does it follow from? What are the assumptions? It sounds like there's something quantum there. Quantum that the measurement rate is minimized. There? Ah, from the uncertainty principle. Um, uh, Natalia, the, the measurement rate in uh, the... Here's a way of thinking about it, Marius. Yeah. That, that, that um, if, 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 if the horizontal axis is the frequency with which the... the the, the system measures the gravitational field. So, so how often does it measure the distortion of space-time? Okay, that's this axis. And then the heating rate is parabola-shaped, okay? So if we make the most pessimistic assumption and say, well, that the, the, the relevant rate of making the measurement is at the bottom of the parabola, then the bottom of the parabola is at 1.2 times 10 to the minus 41 watts for the particular parameters of this experiment. But if we were wrong about the guess that we made as to, as to the rate, then the heating rate would be higher because it would be going up one or other side of the parabola, okay? What that means is if you could confidently demonstrate that the heating rate is significantly less than that number I've just given you, then you could say, we seem to have ruled out the possibility that gravity is mediated classically. I see it. So that's interesting. Um, and how far, I guess we're pretty far from that, but how far are we from that regime? Oh, 10 or 20 orders of magnitude at the moment. I mean, yeah, excuse me. Yeah, I think about 15, 15 orders of magnitude. In, in some sense, it is. It is like, um, you know, it, it is like CSL, right? If you, if you kind of start 
saying, well, here, it, it, you know, this is not possible and this is not possible. It becomes, in a Bayesian way, coming back to Carlo, uh, uh, I mean, you know, less likely. And... Um, well, 15 orders of magnitude, you mean uh, now with respect to actual capabilities in the to, lab? To what we, what, exactly, ah. to, to well, what we can do now in the lab, let's say. We're doing as well as the tests of string theory, you know, so we take courage from that. <laughs> well, yeah, no, it's true that 15 orders of magnitude is a lot, but uh, I mean, for quantum gravity, I don't know how far we are from any actual. But, but Narius, trivia earlier on. If you want a positive test that demonstrates positively that gravity is mediated quantumly, the positive way to do it is to create entanglement between two objects that have no other interaction between them. Right. right. Maybe, but that, that's maybe not the, the only way to do it. If you think about the discovery, I mean. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm touching my table there. This table is not conducting. The fact that it's not conducting is because electromagnetism is quantum. So there is, or the, you know, the fact that the sky is blue. I mean, the thing is that now we know that there are very, quantum mechanics is all around us. There's very microscope. I, I don't, I'm not saying it's the same thing for, so, you know, maybe we're not imaginative enough in, in the way we should read in quantum gravity. There's maybe, you know, observable like the band structure or something which are very, you know, which are absolute consequence of quantum gravity, which, which uh, of course today we don't know, we don't make the connection. So I, I'm going back to the historical perspective. The way people prove that electromagnetism was quantum is not by observing the quantum electromagnetic field, it's by just studying the, the interaction of electrons with metals and then, and then, you know, looking at, at part of the fact that the Drude model was going wrong, and and or or by looking at the tails of the of the black body spectra, and you know, I mean, it, it was very very indirect. But uh, anyway, so here, yeah, indeed, yeah, I, I, not, I agree. Yeah. and and to answer your question, uh, yeah, they are completely different. Like these are two different options. Um, the, the, conceptually. Uh, there's no difference between saying gravity is classical or saying the geometric field is classical. Experimentally, as Andrew is saying, it's infinitely different. But going back historically, you know, uh, the sky is blue because, uh, you, you know, the, or, or water boils because matter is quantum. I mean, there's many things that we know which are experimental fact, which were yeah. with inside linked to the quantum mechanical nature of electromagnetism. So, I'm an interesting thing to discuss might be uh, the predictions of the gravitational Casimir effect. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know a huge amount about it, but I think it's an interesting uh, avenue of investigation. Um, what is, yeah. uh, what, what is it? <laughs> the gravitational um, well, I can let, if someone else knows more than I do, they can, they can go ahead or I can. So I think the prediction arises from just like you get the uh, electromagnetic Casimir effect. If gravity is quantized, uh, you should get a gravitational Casimir effect under mm -hmm. the right conditions. Um, I can I can post a reference to a to a paper about it. If yeah, you... one of uh, Anna's um, examiners of her thesis, uh, Rita Norte, has been exploring that. Was great great. doing experiments with the gravitational Casimir effect. Between two superconductors, they have a way to screen out the electromagnetic effect and see the the attraction from gravity. Well, they they use two superconducting plates spaced very close together. Um, but that, my knowledge of all these experiments on the Casimir effect, also like the dynamical Casimir effect. So basically, all they are measuring all the time are Van der Waals forces. So I am I am a bit skeptical <laughs> uh, on on even on the, the electromagnetic side. So extending this uh, uh, to gravity seems a bit uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are not we are not super familiar. We, we read I mean there are people looking into this very very carefully, and we, we read this work. But um, but yeah, I I, I agree that, uh, that these are, are proposed experiments and. Um, 
it's just a suggestion of a, a another avenue of investigation. Um, I'm just finding the reference now. Mm -hmm. I have another question that I wish I asked at the beginning of the talk, but. So you said that there is an there's heating of the material caused by the collapse, right? So is this just energy that is popping into existence at any given time, or is it coming from somewhere else? It's from the gravitational interactions, um, but it does violate energy conservation, I believe. All right. Yeah, I mean that's right. I mean, if, okay. if, if one object is quantum, the other is classical, you have to, you have to violate energy, you have dissipation. That's the same thing for the electron orbiting right. around the atom. Um, yeah, but in that and, case, and, I thought that the energy comes out of, like is the electromagnetic energy of the electron coming closer to the proton and the, and the light goes out. So there's like a balance of energy here. It's just the thing is sitting on its own and is heating up. And it's Can not an decaying. We can make an engine on this, make money. <laughs> yes, I'm 10 to the minus 41 watt uh, engine. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I think they were investigating like linking it to possibly like dark energy or dark matter, but I, I might have remembered that wrong. Um, but it, it's something that people are thinking about where, where does the energy come from? Well, I think that um, I think Phil Pearl's CSL long predates the dark energy uh, debates, doesn't it? I mean, that might be a new explanation for it, but I think the mm -hmm. the uh, those sort of questions go back earlier. Carla, you must know more about this. Yeah, there are attempts to uh, to connect dark energy with a. Uh, with a um, uh, with a sort of quantum dissipation of that sort, uh, but I I don't know. I mean, I, I'm I'm uh, I I think that that doesn't help us in a sense. I mean, it's a it's a it's that uh, Andrea's question is very it's very so. You from your perspective. Uh, you might think this is an energy non-conservation effect or, or not, or somehow you're pumping energy from somewhere else. I guess that's a... Yeah, this is in the that question. Sense, yeah. Sorry. In, in that sense, it's, not, it, it's the same as CSL, right? In CSL, you would have the same... The same it's, it's, it's exactly the same problem. In, in CSL, you have the same problem. Yeah, so this energy non-conservation. But they leave the question open, I guess. And my take is that you leave it like, okay, we still need to find a more general theory. Maybe there's a coupling of matter with something else that, that gives this energy non-conservation. Uh, but I don't know what happens in this case precisely. Um, yeah, no, it's it's. I I, I think in in our in, in this case, it's, it's the same case as in CSL. It's it's. I think an open question if if I'm not wrong. Okay, thanks. Um, so we've been going on almost two hours now. Um, we should uh, slowly wrap it up. Mm -hmm. Unless there is somebody that absolutely wants to ask something uh, or add something. I don't know. What it, I mean, you know, we're <laughs> learning from it. No, I, I wanted just to say, I, I you know, um, this discussion made me think that you know what 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 uh, you're doing uh, you know you can you can label it as as the in fact the most the, the first quantum gravity experiment that is more philosophically what is the problem in t testing quantum gravity it's it's you know um theoretically there's really no no issue the, the problem is, is is somehow trying to shield out or screen out the electromagnetic interaction so that you reveal a phenomena with you know which is purely quantum gravitation, whether it's individual charges, global systems. So that's the challenge, right? Here you're saying, well, the first thing to say is that we know that electromagnetism is quantum. So if, you know, uh, uh, gravity is not, then, okay, then clearly there's a one, there's an order one effect, right? So, 
So by definition, uh, uh, you, you are in this setting where you're testing something where um, it, it is shielded. I mean, as, as Carlo was saying, it's maybe Byzantium, not very probable, but still, right? Uh, this is part of this challenge. What kind of experiment can we do where can we, we, do exactly? we extract, we neutralize, you know, electromagnetism and yeah. Yeah, indeed. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Is that what, what, what can we, you know, what can we um, expose with, with the, the, mm -hmm. what we have experimentally in terms of technology? And so far, the only things we know how to do it is to take bigger mass because of the screening effect. That is, if I take uh, 10,000 atoms, well, you know, the total charge will, will cancel each other and therefore I don't see it, right? I mean, I don't feel the electric charge of the sun, but I feel it's, it's gravitational pull just because, uh, you know, one plus one is two and one minus one is zero. I mean, that's, that's essentially, so is there something, that's why I'm focusing on the screening effect. Can we, I don't know, is there a way to uh, screen, which is different than just uh, taking a big soccer ball? Uh, hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's indeed a, a very good point. And, and something for us to, for us experimentalists to, to think more about how to exploit that, that particular characteristic. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned the quantum entanglement related to quantum gravity. Is it possible that the quantum entanglement is simply related to electromagnetism and not gravity? It could be a different mechanism. Um, you could still have quantum gravity, but maybe not have, not have quantum entanglement with that quantum gravity. Uh, is that conceivable? Um, well, of course, Richard, if you were going to do this experiment, um, because the electromagnetism is such a, so much stronger than gravity, you'd have to be very sure that you'd eliminated that as a source of entanglement and any other sources, you know, mechanisms for creating entanglement. So you'd have to be sure that you'd eliminated those if you were going to do such an experiment. Yeah, I'm thinking that the point of uh, uh, Vatko and uh, Chiara and Bose is, uh, yeah, to show if, if you have entanglement, then the mediator must not be classical, cannot be classical. Um, yeah, that, that's the very idea. Um, so yeah, if you can prove that there's entanglement between them and it is just me, I've been mediated by gravity. So if you screen all the other interactions, then uh, you can maybe claim that the, uh, the gravity is, is non-classical. Yeah. Also, I, I think that this point uh, uh, of energy conservation may be worth more yeah. study. I, uh, I, I agree. I mean, initially, the way we discovered uh, electromagnetism entanglement is not via measuring entanglement. It's just if, if you have fundamental energy conservation, the messenger cannot be classical. That's that's very simple, yeah, right? That's right. And and uh, I mean, this is what you're exploiting, right? Mm. And, and I don't think that part has been exploited in the Bose type of experiment. I yeah. have a feeling, Marius, that if we were in happier times, at this point, you'd be opening a very good bottle of wine for us to enjoy. I think. <laughs> yeah, that is exactly the stage at which uh, we're in. That is right. Um, but I think these discussions are important also. I mean, we're, you know, trying to squeeze out some. I was at uh, 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 a Royal Institution dinner two weeks ago, except of course I wasn't because of the lockdown. <laughs> but um, to make sure that we all enjoyed it as we would have done if we could have gone there, they, 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 everyone who would have been at the dinner in happier times received a lovely bottle of wine from the Royal Institution that we could enjoy <laughs> during the event. <laughs> it was a very good way to do it. <laughs> yeah, well, we should, uh, that's a, I would take the suggestion. <laughs> 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 
And uh, Natalia, Andrew, this was really great. So I'm, I'm very excited for, for, for this is going on. This is fantastic. Well, thank you, Carlo Diaz. This, uh, thank you so much for this discussion. You leave us thinking a lot, mm -hmm. which is always uh... the same for us. I think that's that's you know the mixing these two culture is is we're learning. I, I, it's and, and I would I would point you to that chapter that I put in the chat that came out last week, which has eight new questions to think about. Okay, we will. <laughs> yes, thank you for that. Um, is there some question that you? Uh, inserted in that book that you contributed. Andrew. So are you asking us? Yes, the eight questions. Oh, Maris, that's a very dangerous question because we could spend another two hours telling you about the questions in the book that we're interested in. Okay. Very dangerous. Let's never talk about that. <laughs> Give us another two hours, another day. Send a bottle of wine in advance and we have a very <laughs> good conversation. Yeah. Deal. Okay. No, I'm serious. Actually, we'd love to talk through those questions. I mean, that would be a really interesting discussion for us. Yeah. Great. So, thank you very much, um, all of you, Anna, and Natalia, and Andrew, and thank you also, Loran, Carlo, for staying, and everybody else. Um, it was great, and uh, take care, everybody. Very stimulating. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mario, the organizer. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for organizing. Thank you, Mario. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Marius. Thank you very much. That was really super. Thanks for convening it. Thank you, Andrew. It was great to have you. It was really great that we had all three of you. Um, you see that people are very intrigued. They, uh, we are all trying to squeeze some idea out of this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we will follow up, um, try to understand this better also with, uh, with Carlo. Um, I don't wanna keep you more, except, uh, uh, I don't know if you wanted to. No? But I, I meant what I said, if you want to have another discussion another day on those eight questions, I'd love that. I'd love to know what people think about them. Okay, I will uh, definitely look at it. I didn't know about this uh, book. I took a note. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's, uh, this is the whole point, trying to find an experiment that is interesting. Yeah. Where are you sitting today, Marius? Today I'm in Frankfurt. I'm in the middle of trying to escape the lockdowns in... Uh, Europe trying to go towards Asia. I'm in Frankfurt uh, for uh, a flight transit and they just announced the lockdown yesterday. Well, we just had an announcement this afternoon actually that Oxford has moved to the next tier in the UK system, oh. which means that we're not allowed to meet with anyone from any other household indoors from Saturday. I see. Um, yeah, we have a few rough months ahead of us, I think. Mm. Um, but, you know, I mean, last time this happened, Newton thought about uh, uh, his theory, right? Sorry? L last time. I mean, uh, when uh, the pandemic happened, in um, when Newton thought about his theory of um, gravitation, I think, um, mm. he was um, locked down in some village because of, the pan of a pandemic. Because of the Spanish flu, that's right. Right. Spanish flu. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Well, look, Maybe um, we'll uh, well, think of something. Yeah, well, I hope you get back home and do organize um, another discussion another day if you want to look at those eight questions. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. So let me set this up um, and give, give us some time to have a look at them. Yeah. Um, that would be great. We could do a panel um, with, where we have. Um, we, maybe another experimentalist. That um, would be good. I'd encourage that. Yeah. Okay, I will follow up on this. That's fantastic. And take care, Andrew. Thanks so much, Marius. Thanks for today. Really enjoyed it. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.